Welcome to everybody here as well as the other two rooms viewing. Hopefully you guys can keep up. I have two talking speeds, fast and faster. And uh, what I'm going to share with you is uh, some of the things I've learned over the years. As uh, Randall said, I've been working with it since 1978. I've been working with producers like yourselves uh, as well. Uh, I had a university grant uh, from 83 to 89 work at, with the farmer, his equipment, his knowledge, his soils, what does it take to go no-till? I am heavily biased to no-till. Yes, the title does say conservation tillage here for the conference. But to me, if you really want conservation, you're not going to do the tillage. And uh, when it comes to the, being a keynote speaker, I'm honored for that. And keynote speakers uh, typically speak either at the beginning, at lunch, or the end of the meeting. Those at the end of the meeting are to sort of wrap things up and send you home charged, ready to go. Those at noon are usually some exec who's just passing through on his lunch hour. He wants the free lunch. I don't mind those. Uh, at the beginning of a conference like this one, uh, I'm taking it upon myself to challenge your thinking. Open your minds up and open your minds up to the other sessions going on around this conference. Because we're going to talk about a lot of things in the next couple of days. Uh, program says no-till systems approach. I don't put the word no-till in my title slides. No-till is just a tool. The key to make no-till work or reduce tillage systems is residue. Put that on there first. I learned that back when I first started working with it in 78, 85 Farm Bureau. Residue was part of it. As we went on, we learned more about soil health, soil biology, what's going on out there. And again, we're going to see a lot of that at this conference. Systems approach, I just want to remind everybody that every step you do is going to move on, affect some future steps. And so what we want to make sure is you don't screw up the system. So again, we've got to think about it. And point blank, we've done a good job. We've reduced our tillage. We left some residue out there. But when you start thinking about that's the 85 Farm Bill, we've moved on a lot since then. What's happened over years, we started at some high level of organic matter, native prairies, uh, forest lands, whatever, 5 8%, depending on where you're at. We've mined them down with tillage, using the organic matter, we get down to... Two, three, four percent, who knows what, maybe one percent, really tillage intensive. Switch no till, we build up a little bit because we stopped doing the tillage. To build up further, though, we need to bring in more the cover crops, the soil biology, things like that. And when we start thinking about that, a lot of people talk about soil is, I call it half there, half not there. The bottom half there is the solid materials. The organic matter, again, I just chose a five there, sort of in the range, or mineral matter, the nutrients, uh, sand, silt, clay. Above that, then, is the pore space, the spaces between the soil particles. Ideally, it should be half air, half water. And so when you think about an ideal soil, that's what we are working with. Many of us are less than ideal, though, because we've done things out there. One of the worst things you can do is drive on or till a wet soil. Those soil particles are lubricated. The tires themselves, the tillage themselves, those lubricated soil particles slide together and lose the pore space between the soil particles. And so then we have problems. Those problems, I show two of them here. One is full width tillage compaction. The other is tire traffic compaction. I got a lot of producers ask me, what about compaction? How do you go into no-till if you got compaction? I say, what caused it? Typically, it's tillage. Stop doing the tillage. And what we're going to look at, though, is compaction is the loss of the pore space between the soil particles. Now, a lot of people draw the, this graph as a pie chart. I like it as a bar graph. The solids there on the bottom are non-compressible the sand, silt, clay, organic matter. What happens, we lose the pore space between the soil particles, and that is the rut that appeared in that previous picture. Now, full width tillage, you don't see that pore space disappearing. But with that pore space disappearing, again, if it's half air or half water, when we look at that, we've got less water in the soil profile. When it rains, the soil profile gets full quicker because there's less pore space. When it dries out, it dries out quicker because then we've got less water stored. So again, I want to park the tillage tools and build some soil health, soil biology. And this is on, down at K-State. I was on a tour of theirs, right down the tour tram. Notice their long-term tillage plots there. You notice the tilled ones are taller. I asked him about that. And he thought, well, maybe it's because the residue is catching soils blowing across there. No, it is tillage has beat down, beat out the pore spaces between the soil particles, making it denser, less water storage, less air exchange for the roots. So again, we want to build that soil, build the soil structure up. Now, even if the soil is dry, though, doing tillage is not doing yourself a favor when it comes to soil structure, soil biology. Uh, Western Nebraska, I saw one of the worst case examples. This is an organic 
wheat producer. Wheat fallow. He's trying to store moisture by not cropping for a year. So in that 14 months from harvest till planting the next crop, every time he had some weeds out there, he did another tillage pass. The soil surface is right above the top of the slide here, so you don't see it there. In that tilled zone, he has beat every pore out of that soil. There's no pores left. You even wonder how roots can penetrate, how water can penetrate. Down there, you see some horizontal plates. Those horizontal plates are actually where you could pull it out, and you can see the sweet marks where he'd done tillage when there was a little bit of moisture. Look below that, though. Freeze thaw, wetting and drying roots, there is some vertical structure. That's what Mother Nature builds for us. Mother Nature doesn't do tillage. Mother Nature has beautiful soil structure. We come along with an eraser and take it off the top. We don't want to do that. Now, he's a wheat fallow. Here's what his wheat looked like. As you take a look at that, it's not a very good stand of wheat, but look at the soil itself. Does that look like a healthy soil, a living soil? When I start thinking about soil life, soil biology, does that soil look that much different than this one? We all know there's no life on the moon. We've done some dumb things with tillage. We've done some dumb things in the past. And again, I want you to think about building the soil up. You know, Mother Nature built soil by having roots in, living in the soil. The root was there year round. It was actively growing, depends where you're at, depends what it was, how dormant to go for winter. But it's actively growing maybe nine months, 10 months, 11 months a year. We as farmers or our ancestors thought, well, I can tear up the native, I can go out and I can plant corn or soybeans or whatever. They're only actively growing about five months a year. When you think about how we build soil and build soil health and feed the soil system, it's taking sunlight energy, carbon dioxide, which are free, and they can't really store them unless we grow them into a biological system. And that biological system is going to be residue on top and roots in the soil. That's how we store our carbon dioxide and our sunlight energy. So we've got to think about harvesting that in the off season. That's why I get excited about cover crops. Again, like I say, our ancestors, we thought, oh, we can do tillage. Go out there and do that. Again, Mother Nature didn't do tillage. Now, years ago, if I gave a talk about compaction, you'd talk about a plow pan. Well, hopefully you stop plowing. But we start thinking about what we've done. You know, here's a root restricting layer here. Now you're going to park the tillage tools, go out and no-till. You put a seed in the ground there above that layer. The roots start growing down. If that layer is dry, roots aren't going to penetrate. You're going to say no-till failed. No, no-till failed because of lack of soil structure, lack of soil biology. It's because of all the tillage. Well, Randall and I are egg engineers, and I say egg engineers are here to save you. Well, maybe. We did it in a dumb way. Some egg engineers somewhere figured out if you take a pointed stick, take it down, where that compaction layer is, say an 8-inch plow pan, go 50% deeper, down to 12 inches. Take a pointed stick through the soil, the soil fractures in a V-fracture, and if you move over another 12 inches or so, another V-fracture, sorry about that, the chisel plow was born. Engineers, equipment companies, all right, do this for a couple years. We broke up the plow pan. We go out there and we do secondary tillage. We smooth it out. After a few years, all we did is take a plow pan from 8 inches, moved it to a chisel pan at 12. Is that enough root zone? We start thinking about what's going on. Here's a producer I met that's been chiseling for years. Wet harvest. Now, maybe you guys see this in your neighborhood. Maybe not. He's got rice leg tires on his combine. Rice leg tires are real tall lugs. Those real tall lugs, you admit two things. One, you admit you have no soil structure. You got cut down through the mush, thus the ruts. But number two, you admit you got a compaction layer underneath, and that's where you're going to get your traction. That's his chisel pan at 12 inches. Now, after saying that, anybody brave enough to raise your hand? You got rice leg tires in your combine? Think about it. We've done some dumb things, and we keep trying to solve the problem by doing something else. And in my opinion, a lot of times that something else is just as dumb. All right, plow pan is 8 inches, chisel pan is now 12. 50% deeper would be 18 to 20. Hey, the engineers again, V rippers are born. 18 to 20 inch shank space and 18 to 20 inches deep. Tear up the soil. You got to like your fuel, man. Do you like that big tractor? Smooth it out a little bit. Now I've got my pan moved from 8 to 12 to 20. Now what do we do? 50% deeper. Shank spacing equals operating depth. 30 inches deep. Here's me in my younger days, leaning on the new DMI Ripper at a farm show. We can get rid of that compaction. We break up all the existing soil structure. The next pass, we pack it back down. It's a dumb thing we've done. Like I say, we've done some dumb things in the past without thinking about the soil. We have to think about the soil. 30 inches. Is that deep enough for a root zone? No problem. 
look close there. I copied the entire ad there, or the entire story. The caption there says, Compaction doesn't have a chance and Mike Peeper deep rips with this rig he designed and built. 13 foot wide implement takes 320 horsepower to pull three to four feet deep. 30 inches, 50% deeper is three to four feet deep. We've done some dumb things just as we can. I'm saying let's stop that. Let's park the tillage tools. Let's go to no-till. Let's think about that systems approach to crop production, but also the systems approach to building that soil. Show the variety of tillage systems here. I'm a fan of the no-till system. When you've got the system working with you, that's the best thing you can have because, again, you've got the best, healthiest soil. We're not destroying it with the tillage. But notice out in front of that equipment, uniform height of residue, uniform spread of residue. The systems approach, we've got to think how everything fits together. And as we think about that, I'm going to talk more about equipment here at Corn College. I'm going to talk more about residue spreading, for instance. And residue spreading, this field's already planted, one of our no-till fields. Herbicides rained in and activated. All the residue is still in place. Where did the combine run last year harvesting that field? If you can think, if you can see that in your field, you don't have uniform conditions. You want uniformity every day of the year when you look at a field. Randall said I started to set a plot back in 1981, there in year 37. This is a picture, oh, about 1990 or so. Uh, No-till soybeans next to tilled soybeans. There's some soybean seeds there in dry soil. There's some under a crust. There's some that's never going to grow. The no-till side, everyone is up and growing. I love no-till. I know where the soil moisture is. Every seed's in the same soil temperature, the same soil moisture. It's going to give you the most uniform stance for your maximum yields. Now, 1981, I started the plots. 2015. Yield ranges. These are dry land plots 10 miles east of Lincoln, Nebraska. We're in about a 27 inch rainfall area. 223 in the corn, 60 on the soybeans go down to the tilled, not as good. And it's been consistent that way because I've got residue there. I'm building up soil health, building soil structure. 2016, I don't have on a slide yet. The no till was 228. On the corn, soybeans this year were 63. So again, we build up that soil and use it to our advantage. Now, before it sounds like I do everything right. This is year one on those plots. Year one, I learned there is no such thing as a recipe. What works someplace might not work someplace else. When you're reading in the Ohio Farmer magazine, you know they're usually talking about somebody from Ohio. But when you pick up Farm Journal Successful Farming, somebody else that covers the nation, go back to the first paragraph in their story and see where are they from. In 1981, no-till was really getting started out in Kentucky, Appalachia. They said, don't do anything until planting time. You plant. There's two different planters planting no-till grain sorghum into corn residue. You've got to hunt to see the corn residue. No problem. Your second trip is the sprayer, which has your burn down herbicide, your residual herbicide, and your fertilizer. Third trip is the combine. People can get excited about that. Planters worked fine in 1981. Everything since then has been an improvement. The second trip, burn down herbicide, 1981 was a dry year for us. Those weeds were going dormant. Burn down herbicides don't work on dormant weeds. Residual herbicide never got rained in. We had weeds all season long. The trip I had got to save was I didn't have to combine the no-till plots. Never let weeds get ahead of you. Part of the system's approach is managing the fertilizer, managing the weeds, managing crop rotation, managing everything. And one of the key things I've learned I hear from a lot of producers too, if you really want to be successful in no-till, you're going to own your own sprayer. Pull type, soft pellet, I don't care. But what happens is, Herbicide labels out there on the post-emerge products or on burn-down products, they give a rate for a two-inch tall weed, maybe a four-inch tall weed. Well, when you're driving by 60 mile an hour down the road, you see a two-inch tall weed, and it's really already four. By the time you remember to call the co-op, it's at eight or ten. By the time they get to you, it's two to four feet. Never let weeds get ahead of you. Own your own sprayer. Control that. Think about how, again, everything fits together. Again, that grant I had back in the early 80s, this is a farmer I worked with, herbicide, reined in and activated. Should have pulled that one little milkweed there. But again, if we start thinking about the system, then it becomes much easier. This is an old John Deere planter, nothing extra on there. Planting down the old row, I love planting down the old row. But again, when we did tillage, we stirred the soil. And some people, and you may have had neighbors say it, hopefully you don't say it, I have to till that soil to dry it out. I don't want to do that. I want to keep all my moisture I have for my cash crop. And in the olden days, everybody had furrow openers on their planter, push away dry soil and clods trying to find moisture to plant into. And so again, we think about that, till the soil dried out, maybe it's only a half inch, three quarter inch of moisture because a good soil holds about two inches of plant available water per foot. You till it six inches deep, 
you're exposing one, half of that disappears, that's just all moisture loss. But what if you did three trips and dried out that top layer? That's what we used to do. That's why we had furrow openers. So again, we've got to think about it. But worse yet, we lost the soil structure. We lost the residue. With raindrop impact, we then had erosion problems. With residue there to absorb the raindrop impact, we had crusting problems. And so again, we want to think systems approach, build that soil up, park the tillage tools, leave the residue out there. That same residue there is going to reduce evaporation during the growing season. We're going to keep more out there. And when it comes to the evaporation, we study a lot of that in Nebraska. We've got measurements of reducing it two and a half to five inches, reduced water losses, simply by keeping the sun and wind off the soil surfaces. Keeps the soil temperature cooler, too, so evaporation is less. So again, when you start thinking, you know, a lot of guys say, oh, you got plenty of rain here in Ohio. How many sometimes during the growing season they say, boy, I wish it would rain because it's getting dry out there? If you've let the soil moisture evaporate, you're losing water. The other thing is infiltration. As we get a crust on top, as we do tillage and break up the soil pores, we don't have good infiltration. This is from my long-term tillage plots. I use controlled wheel traffic as well. The tilled rows there where I drove, two-tenths inch per hour because that silty clay loam soil, the clays swell up, seal up. Soft row where I haven't driven, and I haven't driven there for over 25 years when these measurements were taken, four-tenths per hour. Well, the NRCS soil survey said saturated intake rate is between two-tenths and six-tenths because of that clay. The no-till, six-tenths on the high side for the wheel track. The non-wheel track, over four inches per hour since we've never driven there. Freeze-thaw, wetting and drying, roots, earthworms, whatever. I've got good channels to get water in the soil. Again, talk to anybody who's doing a long-term no-till. They start seeing that far better infiltration. Now, let's take an extreme case. Southwest Nebraska, summer thunderstorm blew through. This is tilled soil where he planted his grain sorghum. Six inch rain overnight. I'm out there taking pictures. The farmer drives up. Like anybody, I say, how much rain did you get? He said six inches. He said, worthless rain. Crested my soil. I'm going to have to replant the grain sorghum when the field's dry enough and get back in there so I can rebuild my terraces. Worthless rain. His neighbor across the road from a long-term no-tiller. Very little runoff. The water soaked in. He has soil moisture probe rod. He goes down to six feet deep, had a full soil moisture profile on June 13th, raising grain sorghum. That's money in the bank. That's the same rain. The difference is structure. I put the question mark on the six. We don't always have that. But we've easily measured a couple extra inches of water. And what happens when we've got people adapting the no-till system and they are not doing continuous no-till, that's where you get these benefits, continuous no-till. They start saying, oh, I've got too much water. We've got to use the water. It's a water management problem. Now, I've been in areas where they're leveling it, trying to get rid of water. They're putting in drainage tile, trying to get rid of the water. I'd rather store the water and grow it, either my cash crop or I'm going to grow a cover crop or grow something else in my crop rotation. And we start thinking about that, again, going back to my long-term tillage plots. I said we're in a 27-inch rainfall area. This is the year we had 19 inches from harvest to harvest. To the line, the till, 23 bushel soybeans. The neighbors felt good because they were harvesting 25 bushel soybeans until they heard I had 47 in the no-till. Storing the water, using it. The grain sorghum that year, again, to the line, 61 versus 121. You start thinking about using that water in the dry years. It's important. Any one of you sits there saying, I wish it rained, keep the water you already get. What about a good year? 2009, we had plenty of rain. The till was 210 bushel corn, conventional tillage. The no till was 237. Better soil structure, better soil biology, better nutrient exchange, extra yield there. That definitely pays without the cost of the tillage. The herbicide program is the same. Fertilizer program is the same. Everything's the same there except the tillage. Well, one other thing, though. Draw the line in the middle of the screen there. Look on the left side. Standability problems. Tillage has destroyed the soil structure so that the roots can't even support the plants when a summer thunderstorm hits. Our standability problems have gone away as we went to no-till and started planting deeper. So again, think about soil biology. And again, I come to the Nebraska meetings and I'll say, you guys no-till, and about three-fourths of the audience raise their hand, I no-till my corn into soybean residue. Well, one cockerbur growing there, a couple more not planted there, and you can see where the planter went. But they're not continuous no-tiller. That is still a tilled soil when it comes to lack of soil life, lack of soil biology. It's still a soil that's going to crust. It doesn't have good peds, good aggregates. To get the full benefits of no-till, you've got to be continuous no-till. None of the skip a till, as some people call it. 
Now, come here to Ohio, most of you guys say, hey, I know till my soybeans into my corn residue. CTIC survey, the last year they did it, you guys were about 90% no-till on the soybeans. Do both crops, all crops, every year to build the benefits of the soil structure. And for instance here, the clot on your left came from a field that's been about 10 years no-till. You can see the soil peds, you can see the aggregates, you can see where roots can penetrate, water can penetrate. The one on the right, same soil color, we walked across the fence to conventional tiller. You can see the lack of aggregation. You can see the lack of airspace there. So now when you start thinking about water, I total it here, five, 12 extra inches of water. Again, with me, 27 inches of rain, that's how I can raise 227 corn. My best has been 264. That's not bad in that rainfall area. Now you guys get a lot more rain than that. And so what happens when you switch no-till, you've got extra water available. And what happens? I don't know about you guys, but I want to use that water to grow something. I show here on top wheat, cool season grass, peas, cool season broadleaf, corn, warm season grass, soybeans, warm season broadleaf. Get all crop types out there growing because they grow different times a year. Grow something when the water is available. Now in the off season, that water may not be a cash crop. That water is going to be used by a cover crop. Use the water to build the soil, to feed the soil system. And again, they're going to talk far more about cover crops over there. But what happens? We go to some areas of the country where there were corn, soybeans with tillage. They switch to no till. They save five to 12 extra inches of water, and they complain about cold, wet soils. And they say, well, let's use strip till. Strip till is going to warm up and dry out that strip. They're blowing off the water rather than growing the water. Yes, it will warm up and dry out down that strip. But you know what? Without residue there, that strip's going to warm up and dry out all season long. Dwayne Beck, South Dakota, says it best. Don't focus on making planting warmer and drier, focus on making the rest of the cooler, or the rest of the growing season cooler and wetter. I don't like strip till. When it comes to uniform root zone, that's the least uniform root zone you can have. I've got firm soil, then I've got a tilled strip here, depending upon your machine, six to eight inches wide, eight to 10 inches deep. Roots are here, they're not out here. When it comes to standability problems, strip till has a lot more standability problems than no till. Now again, when you start thinking about water conservation, Norm Clark, he was uh, down in K-State, credit down there on the bottom. He was measuring evaporation off the soil surface. Bare soil, eight hundredths inch per day. Now, it doesn't sound like much, but just for quick math, let's use a hundred day growing season. Corn's up actively growing. That's eight inches of water lost to evaporation. Residue cover there knocks it down to seven. Well, conservation tilling said you cut erosion half, you don't cut evaporation half. We get down to hundred percent cover, five. Now, that's 500 times 100-day growing season is three extra inches of water. Corn response, 12 bushels per acre inch. That's what I'm doing. I'm using that water to grow. I'm not evaporating out. 25% bare soil, that's that strip till. Again, focus on keeping the rest of the season wetter. Some people go to vertical tillage. I got a call from a farmer who said, Paul, what do I do? And I go, what did you do? Well, I was afraid of all my corn residue. I went out there with a the vertical tillage tool, and those colders cut all that residue up. Worse than that, it cut it all loose, and the wind blows in Nebraska. The deepest drift I found was about a foot deep of residue, and there was a lot of residue over there in the fence. I hate cutting residue loose. I want residue anchored, attached, standing upright. When it comes to uniformity here, I got some areas there of dry soil. I got some areas that's wet under the residue. How do you handle that? You don't. Vertical tillage. It's bad because it cuts residue loose. Deanne Presley at K-State University has found one pass of the vertical tillage tool interfering with that top layer of soil, the interface between air and soil, decreased infiltration, cut it in half. It, in, it doubled the runoff. And again, that's the layer you don't want to disturb. Park the vertical tillage tools. Leave the residue standing upright, anchored, attached, uniformity every day of the year. This year, not much. Usually, it's snow cover. I try to keep uniform snow cover. Because too often, I'll see where some snow is blown off and some hasn't. Next spring, it's two different soil temperatures, two different soil moistures. This is far more uniform planting into. Residue standing up. The rest of the residue is less likely to blow away because i got a little fence there every 30 inches stopping that. A lot of people look at that and say, well, it's going to stay cold and wet. Exactly the opposite. There's a lot of work now showing that the good soil structure of no-till, the one on the left there, compared to the one on the right, the tilled, 
This is again from my long-term tillage plots, just a tile spade full of soil. The heat from below actually rises from below, melts the snow from underneath. Watch the no-till fields around you compared to the tilled fields. The tilled fields, that tight layer there, or tillage pan, whatever, heat can't rise. It melts from the top and runs off because it can't soak in because the ground's still frozen. The biological activity in the no-till soil, that ground stays warmer. We've got a weather station. We've got soil sensor at 2 inches, 4 inches, 8, 20, and 40 inches deep. At 2 inches, we were frozen for only 4 days this past winter in structured no-till soil with the living root there. At 4 inches, we didn't even freeze. We can actually plant our no-till before our conventional till neighbors can because we've got better soil structure, warmer soils. Our goal is to have all our corn, soybeans, and milo planted by May 1 when our soybean physiologist university says in till soils, soil's not warm enough to plant until May 5th. Ours are warmer and we're growing. Think about it. We get visitors a lot at our research farm. Here's a couple of visitors from the United Kingdom. And they say, are you planting? I say, yeah, the farm manager's out planting today. And they take a picture because they couldn't go, couldn't believe we're planting down the corn rows like this. I had to snap a picture of them. But again, when the residue is standing upright, anchored, attached, air movement can get down to the soil surface. With a good soil structure down below, it could rain an inch today. I can be in the field tomorrow because I'm riding on residue on a structured soil with controlled wheel traffic. And again, you look there, the root balls. A lot of people say, well, the root balls will roll out if you plant down the old row. If you've got soil biology, they don't. If you don't have soil biology, they're still there. And I say that because of my long-term tillage plots. Middle of April, I go out and do my disking on the till plots. Before I dissed, I went and grabbed a hold of a corn stalk, grabbed a hold of one in the no-till, held them up and snapped this picture. The one on your left is from the tilled soil, no soil biology. The one on the right is from the no-till where soil biology is rotting that off from below. It's cycling that residue, cycling those nutrients back in the system. And for any farmer who ever calls me and says, I got too much residue, it tells me they're not a continuous no-tiller and they don't have soil biology working for them. And that's what you want to do is have it working for you. I love planting down the old row. This is that same field. Beans are coming up later. You don't see root balls rolled out there. You see residue everywhere, but you actually see residue starting to disappear because now it's contacting the soil. Again, with the high soil biology, as soon as it contacts soil, it starts cycling. That's okay. That's when I want it to release the carbon tied up into the next crop canopy. And again, we've got to think about the system's approach. I do fall tillage. I release the carbon in the atmosphere, and the next crop canopy is not there until next spring. So again, cycle your residue when your next crop is growing. To the line, in the middle of the screen there, on the right-hand side, that's the day I was going out to do my spring disking on a fall chisel treatment. Spring disking, took this picture in 2014. So this right side has been fall chiseled since 1981. That's 34 years. Spring dist since 1981, 34 years. Look how many corn residue is still there because there's no soil biology. People think you've got to do tillage to get rid of residue. Without soil biology, it's still going to be there. On the right-hand side, it's been no-till since 1981. My residue is cycling too fast. I started planting cereal rye cover crop with Austrian winter peas mixed in. That is in the middle of March when the peas and the rye, you can hardly see, they're just breaking dormancy. But all that residue has been cycled through the system. And a lot of people say, well, that's why I want vertical tillage. It cuts and sizes the residue. And I said, so does my drill. Well, the vertical tillage puts the residue in contact with the soil microbes. I said, so does my drill. My drill puts a living seed in the ground to give a living root to feed the soil biology. There's evidence how I'm cycling the residue now with soil biology. The drill, I like the crust buster. Depth control is behind. I can go here. I'm drilling in about 220 bushel corn residue the day after harvest. All the residue is still there but I'm feeding the soil biology. Here, see the, notice the residue is still standing. I like that when it comes to going over winter. Here's next spring. That's the same fields, but roughly the same place. Where'd all the corn residue go? It's being cycled. Austin winter pea is growing there, fixing nitrogen. And again, this is a study I started back in 2005. No one was talking cover crop cocktails then. So I'm doing Austin winter peas versus CRI, nitrogen versus carbon. Here is the cereal rye just breaking dormancy. This is in a corn, bean, wheat rotation. Beans go in immediately after, uh, into this. After the bean is wheat seeded immediately, so there's no cover crop. 
after the corn is rye versus peas. After the wheat is grain sorghum versus soybeans, carbon versus nitrogen. The difference is the right side here is corn, bean, wheat, no till, no covers. The left side, corn, bean, wheat, no till with two covers in that three year period. Which one's more biologically active? Which one's a more healthy soil? Think about that when you're over attending the cover crop session of this. A lot of people say, well, how are you gonna handle all the residue you grow? I say plant through it. Here's a producer trying to grow some carbon biomass. He's in Kansas, a wheat farmer. Planted a mix with a lot of sorghum sudan in it, a lot of other things in there. You'd be amazed what your cedar can go to. I'm going to be talking about that here at the Corn University next, so you can hear more about it. But again, in corn soybean country, I like to shake people up, say increase your biological diversity. One of the quick ways is put wheat back in the rotation. Once you put wheat in the rotation, it really opens up your options when it comes to cover crops. You can use cover crops after corn and beans. You just got a lot less growing window. Put forages back in the rotation. A lot of guys say, well, you can't make money on wheat. Granted, corn, soybeans, relative profit potential is probably one each. That's why you're a corn, soybean rotation. Wheat might be a three-quarter. If you're growing one crop a year, you won't grow wheat. Short season forage might be only a profit potential of half. Again, if you're growing one crop a year, why would you do that? But what if you did wheat and seeded the forage after the wheat? A three-quarter plus a half is now one and a quarter. The two crops uses water and sunlight when it's available and is more profitable than a one crop. Now, maybe you don't need the forage. Use the cover to use that sunlight and water and carbon dioxide to build your soil. I love wheat in rotation. All of our wheat acres, we get a cover crop out there. I like 12 to 14-way mixes. Get it out there. And again, I'll be talking covers later. But again, when you start thinking about covers, we grow seed wheat. If you've ever grown seed wheat, the seed cleaner guy says, you don't combine the outside pass because I don't want all that brown grass and whatever weeds may be leaning in from the edge of the field. Well, we use controlled wheel traffic. Notice those combine wheel tracks there. When you're off a half a pass, when I go to plant, I'm running on those combine wheel tracks. So my control traffic works out, even though I got a six row equipment because of the terraced field it was designed for six rows. Now, when the combine left the field, I planted everything between those two outside half passes while I left the outside full pass there. Envision your mind, combine left field, plant the cover that day. That's the day to plant your cover, the day the combine leaves the field. Well, I'm busy, I'll get to it in a week or two. Mother Nature hates bare soil. Mother Nature hates it when something's not growing. That's one reason volunteer wheat grows. That's one reason weeds grow. We've got nothing growing there. Well, on the outside pass, that outside pass was seeded when we cleaned up that outside pass a week later. So what you see in this outside pass here is about 11 weeks of growth. The rest there is 12 weeks growth. One week difference on planting made that much biomass difference. Now, if you're a livestock person, you want to graze that, which would you rather graze? See the grain bins in the background? I was on top of the tall one, which you can't see in the picture. It's behind that Quonset. And I took this picture and again, 11 weeks versus 12 weeks of growth. Delay the one week. I lost that much growth in my cover. The day the combine leaves the field, seed your cover. Now, I walked out there just around that curve, took this picture. The first half pass was combine. I seeded the cover that day of that full pass. The next half pass, remember, was combine one week before. Notice how many more weeds there are in that second half pass. One week and nothing growing there, Mother Nature gave me a cover. Start growing weeds. We use covers as weed management. If we got something growing there, we have less weeds. And again, I'll talk about that this afternoon on my cover crop experiences. That mix there, we don't graze it. It frosts down, it looks like this comes spring planting time. And again, I'll talk about planters in my next presentation. That cover there keeps the sun and wind off the soil surface. It's great to plant into, it keeps the soil cooler. Going back to my tillage plots, tilled versus no-till. No-till had residue there, kept the sun off the soil surface. In June, first five days, over 100 degree heat that year. Grain sorghum went dormant in the till. Now when it rained, it took off growing. Everybody says, see, that didn't hurt you a bit. When the combine rolled, 35 bushel per acre difference. Cooler soil temperatures kept the soil biology alive. And I like to pick on people a little bit when you start thinking about soil temperature and thinking about residue. We've got too many guys thinking about removing some residue to sell it. I asked Randall about that if anybody does for corn residue around here. In Nebraska, they take corn because we've got beef cows. Here you might take the wheat straw because you need bedding. Leave the residue out there. It keeps that soil cooler. 
Now, I was blessed. I got to go to South Australia, an area of about 12 inches of rainfall. Two weeks before I was there, it was 120 degrees out. The week I was there, cold front come through, it was 85 degrees. I was blessed, I guess. But this is a no-tiller who is proud. He's been no-tilling for about 15 years. He's got a shank drill. That whole point does a lot of tillage. After his wheat harvest, he harvests the wheat straw to take away for livestock feed. This is no-till. How much soil life do you see there? When you got bare soil and the sun beating down on it, think about when you throw a steak in the grill. You cook it to 130 degrees for about eight minutes and it's safe to eat. Pasteurizing milk, 140 degrees for 20 minutes and it's safe to drink. That bare soil, when the air temperature is 120 outside, the soil temperature is 160. And that wasn't for 20 minutes, that was for 20 days. Where's the soil biology? Next door to them was a no-tiller with a disc opener system and a stripper header harvest. Their straw looked like this. His field looked like this. Kept the sun and wind off the soil surface. Kept that soil surface thought cooler. And again, just like on my corn, which one has soil biology? The stripper head one, residue is cycling from below. No-till, with no soil biology, the residue is still there, not cycling. And again, we think about a healthy soil, we want soil biology out there. Now again, in South Australia, that's sort of fun. This is the one that really shook me up for the people who say, I can't afford to grow a cover, I don't have enough water. This is a 12-inch rainfall area, and they're growing covers to feed the soil biology. Here's to the line, cover, no cover, drug my foot across there. There's plants on this side extracting water, but there's actually more moisture there. It's because it keeps some of the wind off, some of the sun off. It's growing soil. This one is one that amazed me. That farmer was proud of that cover crop. Now, I showed you what my cover and wheat stubble look like. And he says, you know, that cover right there doubles my wheat yield on continuous wheat. I looked at him and says, what? Think again about the soil biology. Without the cover there, there's nothing there to feed the soil biology, nothing to keep that soil alive, such that the next wheat crop is on its own when it comes to cycling nutrients, when it's on its own for everything. I went out there, and actually I found a sunflower that was blooming that was only that big. Sorry, I should have rotated the picture. That's all the root it had, but there's a living root there in moisture growing where there was no cover at 120 degree heat, dried it as deep as you wanted to dig. And again, in a 12-inch rainfall area, covers were doubling its yield because of improved soil biology. I don't know what rainfall you guys get, but improve your soil biology. Grow some covers out there. Other places, always feed the soil biology. Prevent planted acres. Get a cover out there. In Nebraska, we get a lot of hail. We see a lot of covers going down and hailed out stuff because a lot of times nutrients are already applied for your cash crop. Put the cover out there as a nutrient scavenger. Soil biology. Missouri River was out of its banks in 2011. Our Missouri River bottom was flooded. Actually, all the way from Dakotas all the way down through Missouri, there was a lot of flooding that year. Think about soil biology when it's underwater for four months. It's not pretty. Well, water went down in 2012. It was a drought year. And here, no cover, 210 bushel irrigated corn. He could put water and nutrients to it. Look where he planted 75 pounds of oats in early March. Let it only grow for six weeks, planted his corn, jump started the soil biology, and look how much yield he picked up. Never let a soil go dormant. A lot of people think we have to rest the soil. No, you want to feed the soil. Oats, peas, trying to fix some nitrogen. Not enough yield increase to pay for the peas there. But oats, very mycorrhiza friendly. Flooded soil, very mycorrhiza unfriendly. So again, feed the soil system. Some people feed the cattle as well. Covers are good for that. My livestock are, are below the soil surface. I feed the soil system by growing my covers. I don't graze them. If you do graze them, graze half, leave half. To leave something there to feed the soil system. Some people like this in the bank because of the cash flow sheet. I got some extra use there out of those covers. I think I get the extra use by feeding the soil itself. Do some digging in your soils. Look at your soil pores, your aggregates, where water can soak in, where roots are penetrating. I'm building topsoil. Over the years of working on that research farm, I started there in 1978. In 1981, when I got done with my master's thesis, working full time, we took soil samples across the entire farm. Farm is running 2 to 2.2% 2 .2 organic matter. 
started doing that no-till plots in 81. By 88, the entire farm was no-till. Pull soil samples now. Organic matters are not 2 to 2.2, they're 5 to 5.5. We're putting black back in the soil because the carbon dioxide that's being wasted in the off-season, we're putting in the soil. The sunlight's being wasted in the off-season, we're putting it in the soil. That's why we can start raising far better corn, far better soybeans than our tilled neighbors, because we're building that healthier soil. Quick commercial, Crop Watch, our crop production, crop scouting newsletter. Address is down there below. During the sea, growing season, it comes out roughly weekly with what's hot in the field now. And we watch a lot of what's going, going on in Kansas because it's going to blow up to us anyway when it comes to insects and diseases, things like this. It's also our portal for all of our crop information that Extension in Nebraska has. But in the background there, no-till, field day. Take a look. We've done a good job looking at the crop above the ground. Look at the soil. We dig soil pits in every one of the field days we do to show the better soil structure, to show the roots, show the water penetration. Take a look at the soil, what you're doing as you adopt long-term no-till. <laughs>